Government Business, Order of the Day number 1, Telecommunications and Other Legislation Amendment, Assistance and Access Bill 2018, resumption of debate on the second reading. The question is, this bill be now read a second time, and I call the member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The safety of our community and the security of our nation must always be paramount considerations for every member of this parliament. We in Labor have proved, both in government and in opposition, that we always place national security ahead of partisan politics. The Telecommunications and Other Legislation Assistance and Access Bill 2018 is the 16th substantive national security bill introduced over the last five years. I will address the specific reasons for Labor's support of this Assistance and Access Bill shortly. And I'll also explain a number of our concerns and the solutions we believe we've insisted on to address those concerns. But before I turn to those specific matters, I'll first say a little about the general approach that I and the Labor opposition have been taking to national security matters. First, we start from the premise that our security agencies and our law enforcement bodies to the extent that they are involved in national security matters, must be given the powers and resources they need to keep our community safe and our nation secure. Second, we believe that national security laws that encroach on the rights and freedoms of Australians must always be necessary and proportionate to the threats being faced. Third, Labor holds that with the grant of new powers, we must also establish new oversight and transparency mechanisms designed to ensure these powers are used for the purpose for which they are granted and in a manner that ensures ongoing accountability for their exercise. And the fourth basic principle guiding our approach is that national security laws conferring extraordinary new powers should treat those powers as extraordinary rather than as the new normal. These principles are often challenging to apply, but we put a great deal of time and energy into rigorously analysing every national security bill that is presented against these principles. We do this because we understand that in conferring new powers to protect our nation's security, it's vital that we do not compromise the very freedoms and way of life that we're seeking to protect. This means that in keeping Australians safe, we also seek to uphold the rights and freedoms that we as a democratic society hold dear and that generations of Australians have fought to protect. No deranged or hate-filled terrorist can take those freedoms and rights from us. Only an Australian government that has given in to fear, to the terror that is by definition the primary weapon of the terrorist, has the power to do that. We must also always be aware that while the laws we pass can be part of the solution to national security threats, if improperly designed, those laws can become part of the problem. Because our agencies can only do their critical work if they have a good relationship a relationship of trust with the community they are protecting. This has been shown time and time again, with terrorism offences in particular, when the vital information to stop terrorist events comes to our agencies from within the community. David Kilcullen is one of Australia's most accomplished counter-terrorism experts. I've quoted from him before but I think the warning he provides is worth repeating today. Mr Kilcullen was a senior officer in the Australian Defence Forces, and he went on to advise on counter-terrorism at the most senior levels of the United Kingdom and United States governments and military, working, in, as, the, working as the chief strategist in the office of the coordinator of counter-terrorism at the US State Department, as well as special advisor to US General David Petraeus in Iraq. Writing about the challenge of confronting terrorism 
In 2015, Mr Kilcullen warned about the impossibility of making a democratic society entirely safe through the imposition of ever-increasing counter-terrorism laws. He wrote that, and I quote, a truly effective domestic defensive strategy would turn, indeed has already gone a long way to transforming our societies into police states. A purely defensive stance, if it is to prevent terrorist attacks from within and without, would have to include some or all of the following. Perimeter defences on all major public and many private buildings, restrictions on access to public spaces, intrusive powers of search, arrest and seizure, larger and more heavily armed police forces with more permissive rules for use of lethal force, intensive investigations of individuals' thoughts, words and actions, citizen surveillance. Mr Kilcullen's, end quote, Mr. Kilcullen's list goes on at some length, concluding with, quote, the need for a raft of limitations to freedom of expression and assembly. It would also, of course, impose limitations on international trade and require increased state spending, essentially a terrorism tax. End quote. Mr Kilcullen then warns that, and I quote, accepting these impositions as permanent and developing them to the level at which they could actually, in their own right, as the centrepiece of a counter-terrorism strategy, protect against the atomised, self-radicalised terrorist threat of tomorrow, would amount to destroying society in order to save it." End quote. While the new powers that will be conferred by this bill will be used for both counter-terrorism and police work, I believe the warning Mr Kilcullen sounded remains entirely relevant. I turn now to the access bill itself. The Telecommunications and Other Legislation, Assistance and Access Bill 2018, was introduced into the Parliament on the 20th of September 2018. Without specifying a reporting date and without any suggestion that it was urgent for the inquiry to be concluded by the end of the year, the Attorney-General referred the Access Bill to the Committee on the same day. Although the government claimed that it had consulted widely on the Access Bill before its introduction into the Parliament, the public consultation was very short, especially for such a lengthy and complicated bill, running as it does to some 175 pages. An exposure draft of the bill was published on the 14th of August, and submissions closed on the 10th of September 2018. Disappointingly, it became apparent over the course of the inquiry conducted by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security that many affected organisations were hardly consulted at all before the 14th of August, including, extraordinarily, the government's own Inspector General of Intelligence and Security and the Commonwealth Ombudsman. In fact, the Inspector General and the Ombudsman told the committee that they found out about the exposure draft of this bill from media reports. A number of Australian companies also indicated to the committee that they were either not consulted by the Morrison government or, alternatively, if they had been consulted, that when they had made submissions they were essentially ignored. The committee heard compelling evidence that in the form the government introduced this bill to the parliament, it could well do more harm than good. Specifically, as presented to this House, the bill could, among other things, pose a significant risk to Australia's national security, jeopardise security cooperation with the United States and create unnecessary risks to Australian businesses and, in particular, local technology exporters. I'll briefly expand now on each of those key three risks. First, the risk to national security. Encryption plays an essential role in protecting Australia's digital infrastructure. It protects everything from an individual's iPhone to the electricity and telecommunications grid, 
to the banking and mass transit systems. As Cisco put it in one of the committee's public hearings, and I quote, it's hard to overstate the importance of strong encryption, not only to the, to the delivery of e-commerce and message functions, but also to the protection of critical systems. These systems include computer-controlled systems that deliver food, water, transportation services, health, telecommunications and government services." End quote. Key to the concerns about the risk that the access bill could pose to national security is the uncertainty over whether the use of the new powers in the bill could lead to the creation of a back door, a weakness that may be applied to just one device, for example, but which could also weaken the security of other devices that use the same system. In the face of overwhelming evidence from many submitters to the committee's inquiry, the government has remained adamant that the access bill could not lead to the creation of back doors. This is because the government says there is a provision in the bill that prevents providers from being forced to implement any kind of systemic weakness into a form of electronic protection. But that term is not defined in the access bill, and this has led to confusion about what it even means. Without an appropriate definition of systemic weakness and improved safeguards, a range of stakeholders have said that there is a real risk that the new powers in the Access Bill could make Australians less safe and even threaten national security by weakening the encryption that protects critical infrastructure. Such weaknesses could be exploited by malicious actors such as terrorists, serious criminals and state-sponsored hackers. This could mean malicious actors disabling telecommunications networks or the national electricity grid. It could mean hackers stealing money from the bank accounts of innocent Australians or compromising the confidentiality of investigations being conducted by Australian law enforcement agencies. The Director-General of Security has assured the Intelligence Committee and the Australian people that his agency has no intention of using the new powers in the Access Bill to require a provider to do anything that could jeopardise the security of innocent Australians. The issue of inserting a, an appropriate definition of systemic weakness into the legislation has been a major issue of disagreement between Labor and the government that we are continuing to work to resolve even now. The concern that the access bill could in fact pose a risk to Australia's national security was echoed by representatives of Senatas Corporation during a public hearing on 30 November 2018. Senatas is a leading provider of encryption technology, and as its chairman explained to the committee, it is responsible for securing the systems of Australian law enforcement agencies, royal commissions, including the Royal Commission into Institutional Child Sexual Abuse, a number of Australian banks and our defence forces. The chairman of Senate has told the committee that if passed in its current form, the access bill would, and I quote, compromise the security of citizens, businesses and governments because there will be weaker cyber security practices. It will be easier for cyber criminals, terrorists to target systems and be able to break into those systems. The fact that the government and the Liberal members of the committee were a week ago proposing to just ignore the evidence of Senatas, the entity responsible for protecting many of Australia's most critical systems from malicious hackers, was of great concern to Labor. Fortunately, after the government declared last week that they would cease working with Labor on a joint report in the Intelligence Committee addressing these problems, on Monday the government backed down from this reckless course and returned to the negotiating table. Since then, we have been able to agree on a number of significant amendments to this bill to address the most significant concerns that have been raised. If I can turn, Mr Speaker, to the risk to security cooperation with the United States. Another key concern raised by a number of submitters in the public inquiries, public hearings on this bill,
and apparently not even thought of by the government as they prepared and then tabled this bill, was whether it could prejudice Australia's future security cooperation with the United States. A number of submitters drew the committee's attention to the potential problems the access bill could cause for compliance with the US Cloud Act, which was enacted in March of this year. Under the US Cloud Act, it's possible for Australia to enter into a bilateral agreement with the United States to allow Australian agencies to request the data of non-US persons, like WhatsApp messages sent by or to a terror subject, from Australian technology companies directly. This would enable Australian agencies to bypass the existing requirement of making such requests via the US Justice Department, which can take many months to process. Just to be clear, at the moment we have mutual legal assistance treaty arrangements with the United States where uh, our agencies, in a cumbersome system that's been in place for many years, can make a request for telecommunications data uh, via those mutual legal assistance treaty processes, but it can take uh, months, sometimes more than a year, uh, for the data that has been requested to be produced. Uh, that's why the US Cloud Act, passed by the Congress in March of this year, offers uh, a tremendous prospect of much, much quicker access for Australian police forces, for Australian intelligence agencies to simply make the request using the Cloud Act processes that would go directly to uh, a telecommunications service provider that is based in the United States and provided, and this is what the, the basis of the Cloud Act process is, provided that the uh, request did not relate to a US citizen and related to foreign law enforcement from the point of view of the United States, foreign law enforcement processes, uh, the request will be able to be dealt with uh, in a matter of days uh, rather than the many months that uh, presently afflict our agencies in terms of this cooperation with the United States. But the significance of this is that in order to enter an agreement with the United States under the Cloud Act, the US Attorney General must certi certify, with the concurrence of the Secretary of State, that the foreign government affords, quote, robust, substantive and procedural protections for privacy and civil liberties. If such a certificate is issued, Congress is able to object to any such certification within 90 days. The vast majority of submitters argued that the access bill in its current form, that is in the form in which it was presented unthinkingly apparently by the government to this parliament, in its current form it does not afford robust substantive and procedural protections. As such, Labor members of the Intelligence Committee were very concerned that unless it is significantly amended, the access bill could imperil Australia's chances of entering into a Cloud Act agreement with the United States. Moreover, even if Australia were already party to a bilateral agreement with the United States under the Cloud Act, a cyber security and cryptography fellow from Stanford University, Ms Rihanna Pfefferkorn, told the Intelligence Committee that, and I quote, absent some clearer authority and better judicial oversight of uh, technical capability notices and technical assistance notices, I'm not sure that such a notice would be eligible to be served at all through any agreement under the Cloud Act on US providers directly. This evidence, which until this week appears to simply have been ignored by the government, was presented to the committee during a public hearing on the 16th of November 2018, uh, just before the Minister for Home Affairs and the Prime Minister were calling on the committee to accelerate its inquiry. It's important that Australia be able to take advantage of this vital new mechanism provided by the United States. In order to put the Australian government in the best position to do so, the committee requires further evidence from experts on the Cloud Act. Uh, while the committee uh, has addressed in its recommendations some of the matters that could undermine Australia's capacity to work to, to cooperate with the United States under the Cloud Act, further work on this critical matter is one of the reasons for Labor's insistence that the committee should continue its inquiry into this bill. It's absolutely vital that, the, that this bill, which will be domest the domestic legislation of Australia from the point of view of the United States authorities, conform to what the United States regards as 
uh, robust substantive and procedural protections for privacy and civil liberties, and that in turn will need to take account of what is known as Fourth Amendment jurisprudence in the United States, a key feature of which is judicial warrants. What the United States and the United States authorities are always looking for in domestic legislation is judicial oversight and judicial warrants authorising compulsive processes. And at present, uh, this bill does not contain that form of judicial oversight or judicial warrants. If I could turn, Mr Speaker, to the risk to Australian business. Numerous submitters to the Intelligence Committee argued that the access bill in its current form could force Australian technology businesses to move offshore. This could threaten over $3 billion in Australian exports and cost thousands of Australian jobs. Remarkably, it has become painfully clear over the course of the committee's inquiry that the government barely considered, <coughs> sorry, barely considered these issues either before the Minister for Home Affairs introduced the access bill into the parliament on the 20th of September. By way of example, the Australian Industry Group, the Australian Mobile Telecommunications Association, the Australian Information Industry Association and the Communications Alliance have told the committee that, and I quote, the proposed legislation through its mere existence will make Australian exports of IT and communications products and services, or even every Australian website subject to the same concerns by overseas governments and organisations that recently moved the Australian government to ban certain vendors from supplying hardware for Australia's future 5G networks. Therefore, the draft bill poses a real risk for the IT communications export industry, which Austrade values at $3.2 billion Australian dollars for 2016-17. And this figure does not even include the value of other exports enabled by Australian websites, IT and communications products. Collectively, those organisations who gave that evidence to the Intelligence Committee represent the interests of tens of thousands of Australian businesses, including small and medium-sized companies. The committee also received direct submissions from small and medium-sized Australian companies who were concerned that the access bill in its current form would make them less competitive in the global technology market, and the committee has heard from at least two Australian companies that may be forced to move their operations offshore if the government gets its way. Other companies have said that it could lead to job losses. Senatas, for example, has told the committee that it may longer be able to manufacture in Australia if the access bill were to pass in its current form, and that this could result in the loss of over 200 jobs. And it's not just established businesses that may be affected. The Victorian government's start-up agency, Launch Vic, told the Intelligence Committee that the access bill could hamper the ability of local start-ups to develop their products in Australia and to attract customers, investment and create jobs. In response to questions by members of the Intelligence Committee, the Department of Home Affairs confirmed that no report was commissioned on the impact that the access bill could have on local industry and that there had been no direct engagement with the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science during the development of the Access Bill. Once again, we have fought to improve the bill to deal with the most significant of the many concerns raised in this regard. Labor has been consulting with industry and civil society stakeholders both through the committee's process and outside. We have negotiated with the government to give effect to the core concerns. While there are significant outstanding issues, the compromise that Labor has reached with the government will deliver security and enforcement agencies the powers they say they need over the Christmas period and ensure adequate oversight and safeguards to prevent unintended consequences, while enabling continuing scrutiny of the bill into 2019. Labor members of the committee were only prepared to undertake the course of action that they have taken in uh, reaching the agreement on the consensus report that was tabled in the parliament yesterday because of the government's undertaking that the committee will commit, uh, continue its inquiry into the bill into 2019 and a separate statutory review will be undertaken by the independent national security legislation monitor within 18, month, 18 months of the legislation coming into effect. These separate processes provide uh, 
an opportunity to resolve our ongoing concerns about the bill with the assistance of industry experts and civil liberties groups, while also upholding our responsibility to keep Australians safe. Uh, Labor members of the Intelligence Committee have sought and obtained recommendations in the PJCIS report. If these recommendations are translated into amendments brought to this House by, uh, or the Senate by the government, uh, then uh, those amendments will address many of the core concerns raised by Labor and stakeholders. Uh, it is to be noted that the committee will undertake further inquiry immediately any legislation is passed and that the independent National Security Legislation Monitor will do so shortly thereafter. Systemic weakness-related concerns are to be addressed by amendments that define the term systemic weakness, that clarify that term, and also amendments that clarify that technical capability notices cannot be used to create a systemic weakness. Uh, other concerns which will need to be addressed through amendments include an ability for a provider to disclose details of a technical capability notice, except to the extent that doing so would compromise an investigation. Uh, that point is one of particular significance to industry and to all users of the internet, which is an open system. And it would, it would cease to be an open system uh, if um, particular fixes were required to be kept secret. Uh, a further point that will need to be attended to in the amendments is authorisation of a technical capability notice requiring the approval of both the Attorney-General and the Minister for Communications. Uh, further matters to be dealt with in the amendments include that a designated communications provider which has <coughs> concerns about a technical capability notice will be able to request a binding assessment of whether or not it would indeed create a systemic weakness, whether the requirements are reasonable and proportionate, whether compliance is practical and technically feasible, and whether the notice is the least intrusive measure that would still achieve the objective. Two persons, a technical expert and a non-serving judge, would be jointly appointed to conduct the assessment and the report that must be provided to the and, and their report would have to be provided to the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security in the case of ASIO or and to the Commonwealth Ombudsman in the case of the Australian Federal Police. This essentially means that any request to a provider that would uh, that might create a systemic weakness would be subject to a merit review style process. The inadequacy of the oversight and safeguards arrangements provided in the bill uh, produced to this parliament by the government uh, will also be addressed by amendments that will include strengthening the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security's oversight of the powers. This would include explicit notification and reporting requirements when issuing, varying, extending or revoking a notice or request. Limits on the exercise of the powers, including extending the prohibition on systemic weakness to voluntary notices, ensuring that decision makers consider necessity and intrusion on innocent third parties when they issue a notice. There will be also provision for defences for IGIS officials and clear information sharing provisions. The amendments will include also in this oversight context establishing clear authority for the Commonwealth Ombudsman to inspect and gather information on the exercise of these powers by the Australian Federal Police, by ACIC and state and territory interception agencies. Uh, the amendments in relation to the Commonwealth Ombudsman will include notification requirements and information sharing provisions which will complement the inspection activities of state and territory oversight bodies. The Australian Federal Police will also be required to approve any state and territory initiated technical assistance notices and must apply the same criteria and go through the same decision-making processes as would apply if the Australian Federal Police were the original issuing authorities. As members, as honourable members would have gathered by now, uh, this is a large piece of legislation of considerable complexity, uh, which in response to the government's uh, demand uh, that consideration of it through the Intelligence Committee be accelerated 
uh, the Labor members of that committee and the Labor Party as a whole in this place have assisted in that process. Uh, the government has produced draft amendments to Labor early this morning. It's anticipated that those amendments will be moved in the Senate, and on that basis I commend the bill to this House for passage in this House. I say again on that basis that the amendments encompassing the recommendations of the Intelligence Committee will be moved in the Senate.